Hello, my name is Nathan Stuck, and this is Whisper University. Thanks so much for joining us. And I have uh, Dirk Gates on with us, and I'm excited to get to know you better and uh, be able to understand kind of what you're all about. Um, I'm, I'm the founder and CEO of Whisper, and uh, we enjoy uh, sharing all kinds of different tidbits, nuggets, different tech. And I think this is going to be an exciting one that we're going to go over. Uh, as everybody who's watched these before knows, I hate doing introductions myself. I always like to hear directly from the person. So, Dirk, let's turn it right over to you. Tell us, how, how did you end up where you are and, and some interesting nuggets about yourself? Sure. Thanks, Nathan. Great, great to meet you. Pleasure to be here. So I'm Dirk Gates. I'm president of Toronto Wireless. So I've got a long history in mobile and wireless communications. If you go back to circa 1990, I founded a company called Zircom. If you remember the old PCMCA cards, if you're old mm -hmm. enough to remember when notebooks didn't have network connections, I was building those. And, that, and Zircom uh, was a publicly traded company in the 90s, grew that to $500 million in revenue, uh, and ultimately sold that to Intel. Okay. Um, took a few years off and then started a, a, an enterprise Wi-Fi company called Xerus. We were building high-density, high-capacity uh, Wi-Fi. Primarily, the, the early adopters were schools, universities, but generally enterprise needed Wi-Fi as well. And built that over the course of probably better than a decade. Uh, ended up selling that to Riverbed and actually joined Riverbed for a couple of years. And then probably two years ago, two, two and a half years ago during a reorg, Riverbed sold that business unit to, of all people, Cambium. Hmm. So Cambium's enterprise Wi-Fi are hmm. my products from Xeris. And then tried to retire, but uh, but this this company, Tirana, found me uh, last fall, started talking to me about it, uh, their technology, this amazing technology for, for wireless uh, broadband last mile. And my first reaction, having been around Wi-Fi for as long as I was, is like, can't be, you guys are lying. Can't be. Yeah. Done. Yeah. I think that's everybody's reaction, right? It's like, no, no, no. Too good to be true. Cannot no, be true. Right. It doesn't, doesn't work that way. And then <laughs> as I did more technical due diligence and I dug in deeper and I got to understand the technology and actually see it, it's like, holy cow, they really can do this. It's, and it's just, it's amazing. And so uh, I talked to the, the team here and they are growing like, uh, like a weed. And uh, in particular, they were looking for me to help help them figure out how to scale the business. So I joined uh, just after the first of the year, and that's that's been my mission is to look out in, uh, in advance as best I can and help figure out how to build this thing, this rocket ship essentially that we're riding uh, as this takes off. Yeah, I think that's great time. You know, the, the number one complaint I get is just, you know, can I buy the equipment, right? I, I need to get my hands on more equipment and everything. So I, I think I think that's great that they brought you on. And so, so the two companies that you founded both started with the Z. Any anything with that or started with an X? Oh, okay. So I have dyslexia and can't spell it all, but it sure <laughs> sounds like a Z to me. <laughs> you pronounce it like a Z, but it started with started with an X. X is so, at the end of the alphabet anyway, as well. So it's it, any, back there. Okay. So in, the, in the first company, my co-founder's name was Kirk. Okay. My name was Dirk. And we were trying to name the company. Someone said, let's just put an X as a placeholder and we'll call the company Zerk. It <laughs> wasn't going to fly. But since we were in communications, we threw a comma on the end, dropped the K. So Zircom is Kirk and Dirk Communications. Okay. okay. And then when at, at, at the tail end of Zircom, when we were acquired by Intel, there was, a, there was a, an alternate plan on the table to take the wireless assets of Zircom and spin them out mm. and create a new company. And during that naming exercise, we came up with Xerus, which sort of plays off the Zircom, sounds like a cloud. Uh, that actually didn't end up happening. Intel ended up buying the whole thing. They wanted all of the assets. Okay. Yeah. But when we restarted the, a wireless company two years later, basically reassembled the management team and we recycled the name. All right. Well, it works. Okay. Well, that's great. That's great. So well, let's let's shift gears and, and you know and a lot of times when I talk about uh, when I talk to people at, at Whisper University I, I like to get little bits and stories and what they've learned in business I think because it is so hard to believe that Toronto can actually do what it wants to do I want to focus a little bit on that what you know you have a technical background you said you're doing technical due diligence expand on that a little bit right this next generation fixed wireless access. And I would say that that's what this is, right? I would classify it that. Yeah. What what drew you to it? Like what like you didn't believe, and then you did. What were some of those things that you saw that was just like, okay, now I have to believe this? 
So what's fundamentally different here at Toronto is we've taken a clean sheet approach to solving this problem. Mm, okay. A lot of a lot of the other vendors in the almost every other vendor in the industry is trying to repurpose wireless technology that was designed for a different reason. Either Wi-Fi, which is mobility indoors, or 3GPP, which is mobility outdoors. They're they're shortcutting the process by trying to take that technology, that silicon, and applying it to fixed wireless. Mm -hmm. And it can be done. It sort of works it doesn't get you where you want to be. It doesn't provide you a, a real solid alternative or complement to the, to the wired technologies, the fiber. By starting clean sheet, designing from the ground up, doing our own silicon, doing our own DSP algorithms, doing our own software, designing our own antennas, we're able to create a truly fixed wireless solution that was designed for that purpose. Mm. And the, the difference is if you look at our gear, you can see that the, the piece that goes on the house, the CPE, looks like a mini base station. Mm -hmm. It's not right. designed to be mobile. You're not, <laughs> not going to slap one of those on your back and walk around with it. And mm -hmm. that's because it gives you the best, best opportunity to establish a solid link to the, uh, to the tower, to the base node. So that, it's really that thinking of how do I design purpose-built for this application? And it's taken a decade and $400 million, which is insane, but... The results are phenomenal. That's what's allowed us to really take this leapfrog approach to the uh, to the solution. Yeah, I think that you know it's an interesting point. You mentioned a decade. I believe it's almost been like twelve years, right? And over a decade. And and it's I've had several people ask me like, well, are you, how do you feel about you know basing your entire network off a startup? I'm like, you've only just learned about them, but they've been actually in business for twelve years trying to solve this. And I think it's really, really cool that you do start with a clean slate and really be able to, to, to rewrite the script as to what it needs to do. Yeah, I think we're, we're, we're going to drop the term startup and we're now, we're, now we're sort of a pre-IPO company. There we go. We put in our dues and we're growing and we're, we're large enough as a pro private company that startup is really a misnomer at this point. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. I think, you know, what 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 got me on to Toronto is I, I literally I was in San Jose in California meeting with another company that had some new tech and I, I love their new tech. And it was amazing. We've been working with them for over a year. We were one of the first ones to have a, a trial commercial deployment of it. Um, and we would what we like to do is test gear. So we would put up other equipment and it caused interference on purpose. Right. How well is it going to work? What's going to happen? And every time we turned on our other our other gear, it completely knocked the other gear offline. And, and then it would they would tweak some knobs in here and then all of a sudden it would kind of start working, but we'd lose half the customers and everything. And I realized that even though they had an amazing modulation scheme and it was great, if you can't deal with interference, it doesn't matter that I have the best, most modulation or whatever, I, I have to be able to do deal with interference. So I literally got online and was looking up like, what companies are dealing with interference? And, and, and I, I sent uh, Rakesh, your product manager, an email and said, hi, my name is Nathan Stuke. I'm from Whisper. I won $220 million in the CAF auction and I'd like to learn more about your product. Can we meet? And oh, by the way, I'm in California now, <laughs> right? So he said, sure. I met the next day with him. Our hour meeting turned into four hours as we talked about all the tech. And it was really, really neat to see what you guys had done. And then you know, now it's been almost two and a half years of, of working with everything. So, so talk a little bit, you know, that interference rejection. I think that's something that a lot of people miss, right? They, they think, oh, well, you know, I, I saw somebody else got a gig down by half a gig up. Well, that's awesome. But, but, but can you sustain that? And what do you do? So talk a little bit about your secret sauce there and, and what you sure. guys are doing with that interference rejection. And, and so this comes again from the clean sheet approach. So because we have... Uh, both at the remote node and the base node, because we have uh, a large antenna array. The, the, uh, the remote node has, has, has 64 uh, uh, patch elements for an antenna. So it's, it's got a, a fairly sizable uh, array. And because of that, we have extreme spatial awareness of where signals are coming from. And this is key for understanding both beamforming, so you're actually getting the energy going in the right direction to get back to the tower. And so both the, uh, the BN, the base node, and the remote node are, are basically using that spatial awareness to send the energy in the right direction. But it also allows you to understand if you're seeing energy from a direction that you don't want. Mm -hmm. And so that spatial awareness through the, through the, uh, the algorithms, we're able to, on, on a very frequent, every 200 microseconds, 
we're taking a look at where the energy is coming from. And if it's not coming from the tower, then it's interference. And we're able to digitally erase that, basically throw the null in the direction of that, of that uh, inter interfere on a, on a 200, 200 microsecond by 200 microsecond basis. Mm -hmm. And that allows you to take unlicensed spectrum, the five gigahertz Wi-Fi spectrum in, in, in out outdoors as well. It's become pretty dirty over the last decade. And you can still operate cleanly in it because you're able to cancel out all that interference and keep all the energy headed straight to the tower and keep all the other interferes out of, um, out of your, uh, uh, out of your signal. Right. Yeah. And, you know, so we like to test gear um, and we like to put it in the harshest conditions and everybody's like, wait a minute, why do you, don't you want to see how it works? And no, I assume it's going to work in line of sight. Let me put it into non line of sight and really, really test it. And, and, you know, we always then challenge the manufacturers because as you know, most manufacturers, I, I won't say embellish, but it's like, well, the marketing people just, just say you can do more. Right. Yep. Um, so we were testing your guys gear and we, we do what we do a, you know, B into RN testing, right? Where before we turn on a tower, we go out and do it. And we were having great success. And then we came to one area where we were, I think about four miles away from the tower, um, expecting to get about 400 meg. Um, and we had a competitor that had a water tower in that line, right? We could see the tower, uh, 13 radios, five gig radios on it. I don't even know how their stuff was working, but I'm just saying it was one of their main towers. And we, we were able to get, 200 meg only instead of 400. So then we said, oh, well, here's a concrete building over here. So we put the building between us and the competitor's tower. And then we, we shot to the tower and we got 400 meg. So we're like, oh, this is it. This is it, right? This is where they didn't really do the interference rejection. So we called Toronto support and we were an early adopter, right? And we're like, hey, this is what we're seeing. And they're like, oh yeah, your version of firmware doesn't even have interference rejection turned on. Would you like us to load it? And we're like, uh, it's been working amazing and it isn't even on yet. They're like, no, you're just doing beam forming because we were such an early adopter. This is one of our early towers. Wow. So we we had them download it right there. And then we were literally able to reproduce it where we went, could see the tower and couldn't see the tower with this concrete building. And not only did we get 400 meg, no matter where we were, we got like 450 meg. So it was really, really true that we were able to see in a real world situation, that interference and that interference rejection that's there. And, and it, my guys after that were like, all right, we're sold, done. You know, like don't need to do any more testing other than did we install the AP right or the, the BN right and, and go from there. So. As, soon, as soon as I showed up here, the first thing I did is, okay, give me a remote node. And I put one on top of my house and I got, and I'm, I'm very much non-line of sight through, mm -hmm. through trees and an industrial park um, and fired the thing up. I'm getting 620 down, 125 up. Uh, on one of these links. And so the first thing I did being like you is I grabbed my, uh, my closest access point in the house through a programmed it into uni three and started running iperf right underneath right. the unit. Right. Like, okay, I'm going to screw this thing up. No, it didn't, didn't phase it. No, so. no. And, and, you know, I think you bring up an interesting point with that, uh, with the non line of sight capabilities, you know, that that's kind of a Holy grail for, for, for ISPs. The first one, in my opinion, is the, is the interference rejection, right? Uh, and then the next one is that non line of sight performance. Um, so, and you've already talked about the beam forming, being able to, to help with that and, and everything. And the, that interference rejection allows you to really be able to take advantage of any signal you're coming in is a stronger signal because you're blocking out that noise. Yep. Uh, so I think you guys and have the, the whole multipath reconstruction. We, we, multipath is our friend. We'll, we'll take the signal from wherever we can get it and pull right. it back together. Right. Right. Yeah. You weren't the first manufacturer, but you're the first one that has proven it is, is several manufacturers. Now LT manufacturers are saying they actually perform better with multipath. Yes. Right. And not tree multipath necessarily, but building multipath. Right. So that's what they're saying. And they, and they do because you, you have to have multi streams to be able to put more bandwidth through it. Um, but you guys have really, really lived up to that. And it, it's, it, it's, we've been very impressed with the performance we're seeing uh, through the trees and, and what we're able to get. So one of the things that struck me when I joined Toronto and I, well, during the interview process, as I joined them, um, the, the level of honesty for a vendor is mm -hmm. striking. It's, it's beyond what my experience, I'm, I'm used to the Wi-Fi world where everyone takes the max data rate off the spatial, uh, off the spec sheet. Oh, eight spatial streams, right. 160 megahertz wide channel. You can do 10 gigabit. Absolutely. And, and, everyone's marketing the absolute theoretical max. 
walk in the door here and these guys are sitting here and saying, okay, well, if we hit 256 Guam on a normal channel, we actually have the channel link is like 960 megabits, but there's protocol overhead that takes that down to 800. So we're going to say 800 mm -hmm. on the spec sheet. It's like, really? Really? Anybody else, any other industry would be advertising the larger numbers and, yeah. and letting, and then, and then explaining away the protocol overhead. Nope. This, right. this place has been very precise in how they spec the product and, and, honest almost to a fault in how they explain how the thing works. The good news is though, and, and hopefully you'll say the same, every time I talk to a customer, they're saying, hey, your stuff does what it says it'll do. Yeah, if not better. Yeah, because yeah. several times I would be like, hey, this is the presentation I wanna do, or I'm gonna talk about this, and it's better than the specs you give out. Are you okay with that? They're like, well, if you're seeing in the real world, go ahead and talk about it, right? Yeah. So no, I think that's good. Yeah. So, so you mentioned, I, I wanna skip or switch over a little bit to more of a business question. So you mentioned, you know, you're starting at, at Toronto, you know, you've been there for about six months. We, I have a lot of new employees. We, we have every two weeks, we have anywhere from five to 10 come in. Uh, what's it like? And what are some of the things that, you know, you're there for scaling up? What are some of the things you're doing to ease that transition as you bring in new, new employees? Or what have you gone through yourself since you've recently gone through it? So it, it's key at, at this stage of the company, when we're growing as fast as, as we are, I think, We've doubled our headcount in the last year, so people, we're, we're we're now actually more people in the business with a ten year less than one year than than longer than one year. So it's yeah. it's growing at that rate. It's critical that you understand that everybody walking in the door understands the mission. So even though some people you know, aren't aren't touchy feely, having a solid mission statement. In our case, closing the digital divide through uh, through next generation fixed wireless, knowing that you know what what are we trying to do in the world. And then capturing uh, what, what I might call guiding principles or sort of cultural touch, uh, touch points on how do we operate as a business? You know, you mentioned the precision and the honesty and, and, you know, just get stuff done. That's one of our, one of the things we do. So being able to educate the people coming in the door on how the business operates and, and pulling the best parts of the culture out of those, the, you know, the people that have been here five or 10 years and quickly helping the other newer folks come up to speed, that really cements the, the culture and the, and the way we operate going forward. And it, it sounds a little touchy feely, but when you're, when you're building, you're scaling multi hundred million dollar companies, right. there's, there's almost no other way to do that when you're bringing that many people in that quickly. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. We, you know, we, we went from the, the February before uh, COVID started 79, 78 employees to now over 220 and you're right. We have more people here that have been in here less than a year than have been here for longer. And it's a challenge. And, and I haven't met a wisp yet that isn't like growing. Right. Adding, I, I need more installers. I need more of this and more of that. And it, it sometimes it's scary when you become a larger company. Right. What does this look like? And it sounds really neat that even though you're at a larger scale than us, you're still seeing the same challenges and, and it's still fixable the same way. It's about our mission. It's about our why. It's about who we are. And what comes to my mind is that saying of you get what you accept, right? So if I accept certain behavior, then I, I shouldn't be mad that I'm getting it. If I don't accept it, then, then I, I will start changing the culture that we have and those things. So that's, that's, that's great. The quickest, that's the quickest way to, to affect your culture. That's mm -hmm. what you do and don't accept. So, and right. you make that clear when people come in the door. Yeah. You know, scaling a business is scaling a business, whether you're, you're out climbing the towers or we're back here designing these uh, complex systems. It's, it's still all, it's about the people. You got mm -hmm. to do the right things for the people and make sure they're focused and aligned. Uh, and that, that's key. If everyone's aligned and they understand collectively what we're all doing and how we're pulling on the oars, then you go in the right direction. Right. Yeah. I love it when I get to walk the halls of, of Toronto when I come visit and, and just talk to anybody. Like, I don't even know what they do there. And you could just tell they're passionate and excited about what they're doing and they're, they're willing to share, you know, what's going well, what's not going well and what they're struggling with. And they want our feedback as to what we do or don't like and everything. So I, I think it's, it's a neat culture and then adding you on top of that to help. I think that's gonna, that's gonna work very well. Yeah. It's, it, it's, it's been an interesting transition and in just in like less than the last year to start really hitting upon that, that perfect product um, instantiation that we were able to, to launch G1 last fall. And now all of a sudden finding ourselves in a place where we went from literally zero customers 
the hundred hundreds of of uh, wisps like yourself and service providers using the product, it's been an interesting cultural transformation to go from just being deep R and D focused on product, product only. Now we're focused on customers, mm-hmm. and we're making that transition. and And it's it's good to walk the halls and hear people talk about customers and what do they need, what are they seeing, how are they doing. Um, and it's it's the way we open our staff meetings. We start with customers and make mm-hmm. sure that everything's working in the field and there are no issues that are coming up. Um, so it's it's been it's been interesting and it's it's actually very rewarding to to see the culture move in that direction and be very customer focused. Yeah, yeah, I would I would agree. You guys are doing a good job of that. So I, I want to go back to something you mentioned. You you mentioned you know bridging that digital divide and and helping the rural markets uh, become get broadband. Uh, let, let's talk a little bit about like what do you see uh, Toronto's role in that and and how are you enabling ISPs like ourselves to to be able to do that. So if you think about the rest of the world, everybody, everybody else has given up wires. Mm-hmm. You know, no one has a landline anymore. I certainly don't. And, and we don't use Ethernet in the building anymore. We're all using Wi-Fi. And mm-hmm. so the notion, and, and, we all, we, and we've done that for one, you know, both, both convenience um, and, and because it's quicker to, to, uh, to use, it also costs less. You're not, you know, mm-hmm. not pulling the cables everywhere, and it's a lot, a lot less expensive. And so, if we can do the same, and what our what our intent is to do the same for broadband, to be able to help people drop the wires, drop the cables, and you'll have faster time to deploy, um, faster time to service, um, and ultimately, the all of that leads into more uh, you know, better economics, both for you as the provider plus plus the the customer. Mm-hmm. It's the same reason the rest of the world drop wires. We want to go down that path. Now, do I have any, you know, any belief and any um, fantasy that all wires are going to go away? No, there's always going to be wires. Um, and in and in many cases, if in, in in denser locations, you know, throwing in fiber, hallelujah. If the if the economics make sense, then that's going to make sense. But there's going to be places at the edge where fiber can't serve as economically where moving, switching from fiber to wireless, going next generation fixed wireless is going to make sense. Mm-hmm. Um, and, then, and, and it's going to it's always going to bring a toolkit to the market, you know, deploy the right technology in the right place. And if we're doing our job right at Toronto, we're giving you and others another tool that hopefully helps expand the, the, the quality and the, the, uh, just the sheer uh, availability of broadband to a much broader audience. Mm, yeah, I, I like that because it's, you're right. I mean, even if we had all the money in the world and we said, go, go deploy fiber everywhere, um, I, you're still talking decades before it gets done, yeah. right? I mean, it's just a time thing. And and then you even take like old, I would say, legacy wireless, um, you know, in the town that we're in, we have 4,000 potential customers. Um, we have so many old growth trees in, in town. And then we have about four or 500 outside of town. And, you know, we have three major towers to provide service. Uh, we have about four repeaters. We would need about a total of 16 small cells repeaters. And to be able to cover the town barely at 100 meg down by 20 meg up with, with about 80% coverage. And, and that's all fine. And that used to be how we did things, right? It was uh, 90 days worth of engineering. It was another 120 days to convince the municipality it was okay to put up these repeaters. It was another whatever day. And then it was another 90 days worth of deployment. And then it was the maintenance to keep everything running when it got struck by lightning. And, and all those things kind of add up that wireless was, was hard. It, it was a tool and it worked. And we could do it faster than we could do with, with, with fiber. Um, but now I come in with that same exact town and I say, I, I do one ring on the water tower that happens to be fiber fed and everybody's got service 400 meg done yeah. next town. Here we go. And we get everybody in town that has cable options. You know, they're offering 200 meg. We're able to do 400. And then we get everybody in the rural markets that, that has no options. And now they get up to 400 meg and everybody's super, super excited. And, now we are not spending all of our time designing our network. We're spending all of our time picking what towns we want to go to and how can we help the most. Uh, and that, that's, that's a fundamental change. Like, like a lot of people, they start to try to compare apples to apples. Well, if, if I needed three major towers and 16 small cell, I'll need three major towers of Toronto and 16 small cell. Mm, no, you'll, you'll need one. 
<laughs> right? And they, they have a hard time fathoming that until they see it actually work. It, it's it's so nice to hear you say that because the, the mission, our mission has been to accelerate mm. closing in the digital divide. And it sounds like we're succeeding there because it's much faster time to service. And like you said, sometimes if, you know, fiber is great, but if it's going to take five or 10 years, right? I mean, think about it. If I got a kid in elementary school today, they'll be in college before I get fiber. And yeah. what good did that do me? I, I didn't, it didn't help with my child's education. If I stand up a Toronto tower, I can do that in weeks or months. Yeah. And then I've got that child and the rest in the, in the, in the town benefiting from that service and helping with their education. Yeah, we, we do um, some of our small cells. Our, our third tower we ever do is we called them a repeater. It was a two story house. It was the only house that could see uh, the tower. And then we got the other 40 customers in that area. But we had one repeater here in Mascuda that the one house that could see a tower, he didn't want anything on his house. He didn't want to have anything to do with the internet. This was a long time ago, decade and a half ago. And then his son went away to college and got internet for the first time. And he was talking to his son about coming home for, for, for summer. And his son's like, dad, I'm never coming home unless you have internet. I'm just done, not going to do it. And it's like, what? So he like looked up my number, called me and like, hey, whatever that thing you need to put on my house, can you do it tomorrow? Because my son's not coming home unless I do it. <laughs> and, it, Perfect. you know, that was a, a decade and a half ago. Now, fast forward, you know, I love the saying that COVID is like a time machine. It brought 2030 to 2020. Uh, and and the, everything is revolving around that connectivity. And just because you live in a rural market doesn't mean you shouldn't have access to something that 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 is fast reliable and, and can connect you. So it, it's just, and it's great. You guys are at the right time and the perfect timing to be able to help us deploy this. It, it, it really has become almost as important as electricity and water. It's, it's, it's mm -hmm. sort of, it's, it's nowadays on the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, you need right. basic, basic connectivity. Otherwise you, you, you can't work your way up that, uh, that hierarchy. Right. No, no, you're absolutely right. So, so, what what kind of excites you about 2020 and, and going into 2023? What what I mean, I hope obviously I can tell you're excited about coming to Toronto, but but like what excites you now moving forward? Uh, what are you what are you what are you looking forward to? Well, I, so our product fit for the market is so amazing, and we're just getting such great reception. I'm really excited about seeing it continue to roll out, and for us to be able to hopefully get past these supply chain issues and just build more of this stuff because I think we're solving a real problem. I'm also excited now being inside Toronto, looking at what's on the drawing board. We're, we're not slowing down. It's not, we're not stopping. I mean, in fact, we, you know, we've got to the point where we've caught up and in many cases surpassed cable technology. We're going to get way out in front of that mm. to the point where we want to provide a true alternative or perhaps better set a complement to fiber where you can have your choice. I can look at it. I can provide the same service that I could provide either with fiber or with Toronto, I get to choose depending on economics and- Right, right, to market. right job, yeah. And, and what we've got on the drawing board is gonna, is gonna get us there where there's hands down, it's equivalent service, you pick how you wanna deploy. Yeah, absolutely, no, I think that's great. And it's, you know, it, it's interesting as technology evolves, when you really look at it, we know very, very little about wireless. Right. Fiber was invented however long ago. They've made great, great strides. Everything, it, you know, it's there. And then wireless, you're like, oh, yeah, no, wireless has been around forever. Mm, no, 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 no. Not, not the way we're using it and not not for its intended purposes type thing. And 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 that's what, that's definitely kind of really neat to see the acceleration. And the other thing I you mentioned that I, I want to make sure our, our viewers realize is you guys went back to the drawing board and picked your own chip, designed your own chip. And one thing I've been saying for years and years and years is why am I using a Wi-Fi chip that has been slashed and burned to do what? To not use power and to work in very short range, right? I mean, that's just, that's what it's for. And then I put it in an outdoor box and I try to get really, really good performance out of it. And, and it's, it's not there. It's not what it's meant to do. And you're fighting. And, and even if you look at LTE, I, I know a lot of the LTE guys, I, I have a whole hour long presentation on why I don't think LTE is right for, for the industry. And I was preaching that before I even knew about Toronto. And now Toronto comes here. I'm like, see, I'm, I'm right. I'm right. Um, but even LTE as a governing standard, 
doesn't even have a, a fixed wireless subcommittee. No. So, so it's all about mobile. And it's it, all, it, all about mobile. That's the problem. If you're, if you're working on designing battery operated remote endpoints, yeah. you're not going to have a balanced link. You're not going to take full advantage of the wireless technology that goes from one end to the other. It's always going to be trade-offs in favor of battery life. And it'll, it works great for mobile. It's not appropriate for fixed wireless. So that's why we would, so we think of fixed wireless as sort of the current generation of Wi-Fi and 3GB. We're, when we say next generation, it's really this ground up design, purpose built for this application to give you full advantage of the wireless link mm -hmm. as balanced as we can make it. And it, it makes a, ma a massive difference in, in service provided. Yeah, it, it really does. And our, our installers like it because of the beam forming that, you know, before they had to fine tune everything. We had to log into the AP to make sure both streams were about the same. And, you know, they're looking at saving anywhere from 20 minutes to an hour. Uh, and that's not even counting being able to install it lower on the house or, or an, easier, an easier install instead of running a trench or something. Um, it, it truly is that next generation because I would I would argue that fixed wireless has been a workhorse, right? When you add up all the fixed wireless providers in the U.S., we we break into the top top five, definitely top ten, maybe not top five, but definitely top ten in the U.S. That's that's amazing. Like right? I remember back when I started Whisper, people were like, "That's unlicensed. You won't even be in business in five years. There's no way that scales, and that no way that works." And it scaled through a lot of hard work. It scaled through a lot of ingenuity. It scaled through a lot of just, I'm an entrepreneur. We're going to solve the problems. Ready, go. What can we do for the customer? How do we do that? And then you guys enter the picture and solve a lot of my scaling issues, solve a lot of those things that I had to spend engineering cycles on. I had to do a lot more extra work, install more. And I, I talked to one gentleman. He's like, I'm never going to use that stuff. I like putting 26 access points on one tower. I'm like, you like doing that instead of four? And by the way, when I put up four, I still get double the bandwidth that you get when you put up 26. Well, I guess when you put it that way, you know. <laughs> so back to that notion, we, we want to accelerate the closing of the digital divide. We make your life easier. We make it easier for you to go service customers. Then you can go spread that capability farther and faster and so we're, we end up working together to get that uh, to get that acceleration done. Yeah, so we, we definitely want to make your life easier. Oh, and it sounds like we are, and we'll continue. We'll we'll want to work with you and continue to find ways to cut even more time off of those installs and make it even easier for you and and your customers to use the product. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So I, I forgot to mention that you anybody can ask questions who's watching. We do have a question that popped up here. Uh, so it, it, it says, uh, is there a maximum distance, um, with, with Tirana? Um, and I'll let you answer that question. Then I'll kind of say a little bit of what, the, what they had there. So what, what, what do you think maximum distance? What are you kind of seeing? And then I'll share some of our real world. So there, of course, there's a maximum distance at some point it's going to stop, but we have links that go out. I mean, you can probably tell them what your long, longest links are. Um, uh, we've got links that go out 14, 15 kilometers from this building that are working yeah in the hundreds of megabits per second. So uh, right. yeah, we're, we're pushing, we've got some 11 and 12 mile uh, just yeah. over 10, 10, 10 to 12 miles. Right. So. Right. And I know, I know you guys are working on a firmware upgrade to in increase that even longer. And, you know, my guys were like, why would we ever want to do that? I'm like, well, okay. You know, there's a trade-off, right? As the further you go, you have link budget and, and you have time delay you have to wait for. Um, but there's some real good business cases. And, and one of our business cases is we provide service in the eastern part of Kansas. Um, and there are like probably a thousand times more cattle than there are people. Uh, and I, I'm on some thousand foot towers and it would be nice to be able to say, yes, I can go a lot further. There are not a lot of trees out there. It's just the curvature of the earth. And, and I, I have so much capacity in that tower that, gee, the more people I can reach, the better. Uh, so I, I think it's it's really, really good. The, the flip side of that is true, though, as well, is what I've liked is kind of the the no brainer approach. Like we've we've seen two to three miles as long as you're not going through the ground, two to three miles. It really doesn't matter what the foliage is. We're getting multiple hundreds of meg service to the customer. 
Um, and that's what I, my, my installers just walk, they're, they're confident. They know what's going to work. They're like, yep, I'm going to put it here and they, they get service. And that then changes my sales cycle. That changes my whole process. I'm no longer trying to rely on propagation maps all the time. Now, when we get out further, we definitely do propagation maps, but you know, where's that circle that says, Hey, if you're, as long as you're within this range, sell it, we know we can get them. And, and, and we've, we've seen that and it's worked very, very well. So the only thing you got to watch out for is those capacity requirements may change if uh, uh, Mark Zuckerberg has his way and all those cattle are wearing VR headsets and they're all in living in the metaverse. Yeah. Uh, metaverse cattle. Uh, that'll be different. So there's a question in the here. How do we buy Toronto? And is it, avail it is available now. Mm -hmm. um, the best thing to do is go to torontowireless.com and there's a little form you can fill out and we'll, we'll steer you to the right place to buy and we'll get you the information you need. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And one of my, my stories going back to the, the distance uh, and non line of sight, let's call it near line of sight, tree, trees around the house, a field, trees, a field, trees, um, eight and a half miles away, 350 meg down by, by 100 meg up yeah. all day long, real world, solid connection. And I don't want to mislead people. It isn't a forest, right? It wasn't eight and a half miles of, of trees, right? But but it was what we have in a lot of our area. And then in our area down where we have a lot of trees and hills, we have some very tall towers where I noticed all of a sudden it's like, well, really, we're only punching through the trees around the house. And then it's clear sailing to the tower. Um, so that that's really helped us be able to, 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 to grow that out. And the thing I really like about it is that that solid signal you know, usually wireless has about a 40% swing, you know, oh, I can get hundred meg now. Oh, nope. I only get 50 meg now. Oh, nope. I've got 110 meg. Oh, nope. I've got, and your guys, the way you do the interference rejection, the way you do your beam forming, you know, it's a, like a 5% swing and it's very, very solid and scales very well. And it's something that a lot of, you don't realize it until you really start testing it. That's like, oh, holy cow. Now, downlink is super stable. It 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 feels like you're on cable or fiber. It it, it really feels like that sort of service. Yeah, yeah. Another question popped up about availability in Europe um, soon. Let's let's look at 2023 uh, products going through Etsy certification. Now we need uh, DFS, basically uh, radar. Uh, mm -hmm. so, so we've got DFS. We can we can do radar detection, and we're working up a scheme to be able to change channels when we have detected radar. So where our goal is to be in uh, in the European markets in 2023. Okay, cool, cool. What do you see um, are, are some of the roadblocks, uh, like some of the challenges you see either scaling the business or, or bridging that digital divide? What are some of the, the things that you see there? Well, our, our biggest challenge right now, frankly, is building enough of it fast enough. It's mm. the supply chain. I think- Yeah, there's this one company that's buying as much as I possibly, oh wait, did I say I? Oh yeah, as much as, Somebody yeah. is buying a lot of it. We're <laughs> so that, that that's something we hope, you know, knock on wood here that, that the supply chain woes will start to ease up in the next quarter or two. And then hopefully we'll be able to get out in front of, of uh, the demand right now. Unfortunately, as, as you well know, we've got some customers that are waiting three, four, five months to get to get product. And, and we apologize. We're, we're, we're working on it as hard as we can. But we, you know, we're suffering the same issues that the car manufacturers and everybody else in the electronics industry. There are just there have just been random shortages, sometimes just, you know, popcorn and peanut parts that just drive you nuts. And, and we'll, you know, last week we were lying down on on one of our assembly lines for four or five days just because one particular part, a little tiny thing like it, it's like the size of it's smaller than the size of a grain of rice just ran out of those and had a hard time getting them. So we'll work through that. So. That's the immediate issue is, is getting manufacturing uh, up and running. And then going on downstream, I, in my mind, thank you for all the kind words you said about the product that, you know, it's ease of use and ease of install. I think we can make that easier. Mm -hmm. and that's sort of, and, and when I walk the halls here, we talk about it, is we want to make it, you know, ultimately it's about the economics. The, the, the less expensive we can make the product for folks like yourself, the less expensive the service becomes for the people that need the broadband. And so in, 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 in our mind, if we can save another 10, 15 minutes on an install, if we could actually get to a point where it could be a self-install, imagine you could sign up a customer and just mail them a unit and say, hey, mm -hmm. tack this up on this on the, on the south-facing side of your house and you're done. That's sort of the things that 
And when I look at how does this scale and, and this being closing that digital divide, getting more broadband connectivity to more people, making the product even simpler and more foolproof, foolproof and, and getting it in the hands of, of more folks faster, I think that's the going to be the real challenge. And we've, we've got some creative ideas that we're, we're kicking around in here and how to make that happen. But we're always looking to make the product you know, faster, cheaper, better. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's great. I, you know, you, you know, I, I send my good, bad and ugly, right? These are the things I love about it. These are the things like I could do without them if I could, but I'll deal with them. And then these are like the ugly things, like you got to do something about this. And, and I've been real impressed with how you, you guys have really taken those to heart, right? And said, how do we do it? And what I liked about it is, you know, one of the first things I asked for was like, I want zero touch provisioning. Like, I don't want my installers logging into that radio at all. And, and we're close, right? But you guys, you, you guys came, you started out of the gate, like almost there. Whereas a lot of other manufacturers in, in our industry, you, you know, it, it's like, oh yeah, no, here's the radio and you got to do this and you got to do this. And you, you, okay, that's fine. It's not hard, but but I, I just, I need to be able to, and you know, that self-install is an interesting, we used to try to do self-installs. And then as a wireless operator, you found out that was a really bad idea. Um, yep. But if you look back, that's what really set the DSL market. Like that's what lit it on fire, right? It, it really did because everybody had a phone line. All you had to do was put those filters on. They figured out a way to do it. And they went from, you know, millions of, of, of DSL customers being installed a year to tens of millions of DSL customers, hundreds of million, you know, and, and that's something that we should at least be exploring those things and pushing the envelope as to how do we do this and what does it look like? And if it's just me, the operator, trying to figure out how to teach a customer how to do a self-install, that's one thing. But if it's the manufacturer saying, hey, we've developed this thing because it makes it easier for the customer because we think it's easier for the operator. And this is what we want you guys to be able to do is scale. You know, that gets me excited. It's like, whoa, whoa, we're actually having a conversation here about what I need as an operator, what our industry needs. Uh, and it, it's neat you guys are having uh, having those discussions and, and trying to figure out what we can do. And you know, culturally, as I mentioned before, that's one of the, 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 the key things that we're driving here is to try to make sure that we're customer responsive, that we're listening to the customers, we get some great ideas from folks like yourself and others and mm -hmm. great feedback on the product. And we're taking that to heart and it really is helping us improve the product. And our goal is just to get this stuff to roll out even faster. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. So anything we didn't cover, anything else you want to share? Some, some other neat nugget about you. I know we know your background now, something, something else. I'm going to put you on the spot. And so in the, in the couple of years between Zircom and Zerus, I got uh, I got heavily into amateur rocketry, building some fairly large yeah. amateur rockets. You know, 20, yeah, 20, 25 foot tall things that you know. And I, I wasn't going to space, but we were flying to like thirty thousand feet at time. So oh wow, was, that was a that's a fun little nugget about one of my hobbies. You know, and unfortunately, I don't have the time for it anymore. But it's uh, it, it it's a it's a blast when you look at the you know <laughs> the the whole of the rocket science. So it, uh -huh. it, was, it was quite a bit of fun. That, that's really cool. We do. When my boys were in, in Cub Scouts, they're all way older now. But when they were in Cub Scouts, we did a rocket day out at our farm where we'd buy the little kits. Yep. We'd, we'd build them and then we'd go for a hike and come back and eat and then launch them. And uh, the first year we used A rockets, which only go up so far. And it was fun. But of course, you know me. It's like, oh, let's go bigger. So the next year I bought C rockets and, you know, 1500 feet. And then they would lose the rocket. I'm like, oh man, that wasn't what I wanted to do. So we, we then said, okay, here's an A, B, and C. And we recommend you launch it in A, B, and C if you want three launches. And then usually by the C, it was you know way gone and everything. So each letter up doubles the uh, the, the total impulse of the rocket motor. So each rocket okay. motor has twice. That. And yeah. then that's thrust over time. It's the integral of thrust over time. Okay. I was flying motors that were M's, N's, O's, P's. So wow. start doing the math on a doubling yeah. Yeah, each time. So wow. uh, some some of the larger rocket motors. So you're you're flying half inch diameter, three inch long, uh -huh. flying six inch. I was flying stuff that's six inch diameter, eight feet long, full wow. of uh, the same same basic uh, uh, solid rocket fuel that, uh, that you were uh -huh. playing with the kids. I started the same way. I, when my kids got old enough to go play with the uh, the Estes rockets. Uh -huh. I got back into it, and then I started. Then I noticed that, like, hey, they make uh, they make uh, grown up kits too, so you can build <laughs> rocket rockets. Yeah, and I got sucked in, but uh, the kids had fun with it too. Yeah, 
Well, that's really cool. Well, I really appreciate you joining us today. Nice to, to get to know you and learn a little bit more about you and, and Toronto. Um, I, I'm, I'm sure if people have questions. They can go to your guys' uh, face, uh, Facebook page and website and everything and uh, uh, get some more information. Uh, if anybody wants to come see Toronto in action, we, we happy to host people at our office and, and we have a tour we take you on and show you kind of how, it, how it's working. We show you the, the good, the bad and the ugly and what we do there. So uh, thanks everybody for joining. Thanks for great uh, questions from the, the audience. And uh, you can check us out on Facebook or Whisper University channel on YouTube. And uh, Dirk, one thing I will ask is you have done scaling before and I'm in the process of scaling. So I may be calling you a lot for, for not Toronto questions, but for like, hey, this is what I'm dealing with. You know, so, so just be warned, I may be giving you a call because this was a great discussion to have. And, and yeah, it's happy to help. Perfect yeah. for the role. So great. yeah. Perfect. Right. Well, thanks so much. Thanks everybody for logging on and thank you.